Welcome back to the AI Daily Brief. Today, we are talking about something which I think separates the power users of AI from the more casual users. And that is the embrace of the simple idea that different AIs are good for different things. That for specific use cases and specific jobs, you may want a different AI than for a different job. That there is no one model to rule them all. When we talk about AI models, we have a tendency, as humans do with all things, to ask which is the best, as though there is one definitive answer that subsumes all others. This is why when a new model is launched, all of our conversations are about how much better it is than the previous best, rather than asking what it is good at, what it is uniquely good at even. However, if you look at the behavior of the people who are getting the most out of AI, they tend to use a big variety of tools for a lot of different purposes. I've talked before on the show about how I use Midjourney differently than Ideogram, for example, even though they are both image generation tools. Today, we've got a set of stories, all of which sort of add up to this idea of using models for different purposes and understanding as we move more into the production era of AI, what sort of trade-offs between cost and performance real people are making. Now, we kick off with a story that you probably have seen, which is that Microsoft is planning to actually use Anthropic models inside its Office 365 Copilot product. Of course, historically speaking, Microsoft has used exclusively OpenAI models, or a combination of OpenAI and their own internal models, but primarily OpenAI. Now they're looking to buy from Anthropic as well, specifically using Claude for a set of features and functions inside the Office suite. Now, if you've seen the coverage for this, you've probably seen it presented as some big psychodrama between Microsoft and OpenAI. And certainly it is the case that Microsoft is on a larger trajectory of trying to have at least some amount of distance from its partner. It's basically been on this trajectory ever since the whole dust-up with Sam Altman being fired and rehired, and is nothing new. Now, my position on this has always been that Microsoft is sincere when it says that the OpenAI relationship is important to it, and it wants it to go really well, but that they are also clearly hedging and trying to make sure that they don't get caught with their pants down if something goes poorly. This is made all the more important by the fact that their contract is written so weirdly and rests on strange definitions of AGI for very, very mission-critical business functions. And yet, with all that said, it is also equally clear to me that the people trying to read this story primarily as an example of some weird negotiating tactic between Microsoft and OpenAI are missing the much more simple truth that there is just stuff that Claude is better at right now. And if you read the sources, that's exactly what they're saying. Writes the information, while Microsoft's use of anthropic technology could be viewed as a negotiating tactic, leaders developing the Office AI features found Anthropic's latest models simply performed better than OpenAI's at automating tasks such as financial functions in Excel or generating PowerPoint presentations based on customers' instructions. Continuing, they write, OpenAI's recent launch of its flagship GPT-5 model is a step up in quality, but Anthropic's Claude Sonnet 4 performs better in subtle but important ways, such as creating PowerPoint presentations that are more aesthetically pleasing than what OpenAI's models create. This is basically a big business version of the same consideration that people go through when they try to figure out if they're going to use Claude or ChatGPT for any given use case. Microsoft is in this interesting position where because of the legacy of that company, they have incredible distribution and incredible enterprise lock-in. However, one of the real challenges is that all of a given company's employees are using ChatGPT outside the workplace and thus able to know when Copilot isn't stacking up. One of the great frustrations you hear from employees inside big companies is that the tools they get to use on their own time with their personal emails are so much better than the enterprise versions. It doesn't surprise me then to see Microsoft prioritizing what it thinks are the better models for a given use case inside one of their most important product suites. Now, it is notable that they're willing to pay to access Anthropic's models through Amazon Web Services, even though they get OpenAI's tech for free. But still, ultimately, I do believe that this just comes down to an assessment of which models are better for a particular set of tasks. For those of you who are interested by and excited about market competition, however, investor Dylan Reeder points out that this does seem to open some space for OpenAI to launch a rumored productivity suite, given the growing space between them and Microsoft. Now, interestingly, these use cases that Microsoft seems interested in using Claude for seem to be ones that really matter to Anthropic more broadly. The company has just introduced the ability to create and edit documents directly from Claude's interfaces. Users can now generate Excel spreadsheets, PowerPoint decks, Word documents, and PDFs from within the app and web interface. Anthropic writes, This transforms how you work with Claude. Instead of only receiving text responses or in-app artifacts, you can describe what you need, upload relevant data, and get ready to use files in return. They gave the example of providing raw data and receiving back a polished set of documents complete with charts and statistical analysis. Anthropic says that the feature is powered by Claude's computer use capabilities. 
Basically, they're saying that Claude is actually creating these documents in a virtual computer environment before delivering them to the end user. Anthropic writes, this shows where we're headed, making sophisticated multi-step work accessible through conversation. As these capabilities expand, the gap between ideas and execution will keep shrinking. Now, the features are similar to the recently released ChatGPT agent from OpenAI, which also uses a virtual computing environment to deliver generated documents. Writes VentureBeat, both OpenAI and Anthropic, as well as competitors like Google, Cohere, and Mistral, are all chasing enterprise users in hopes of becoming the de facto chatbots for employees. Google has the advantage of owning a workplace suite in Google Workspace, which allows people to create documents using Google Docs, although it doesn't offer the same type of file creation on the chat platform yet. Claude and ChatGPT and Yes Gemini already allow users to generate and edit code with context on the platforms if they're not interested in using their IDE of choice. Having the ability for users to use natural language to create any type of document they need and just describe what they'd like to see keeps people on the chatbot instead of switching to another window. And indeed, it's very clear that these companies are trying to own not just the workflows, but the product surface where the work gets done as well. People are extremely enthusiastic about this new set of features. Professor Ethan Malik writes, Claude's new ability to work with Excel files is the best I've seen so far. I've given it existing spreadsheets to work with and asked it to create new ones, good use of formatting, formulas, etc. It created all of this, and he shares a bunch of documents, including 406 formulas from one prompt and it's solid. Olivia Moore from A16Z writes, Claude can now make slide decks, and in my opinion, its agent is much better than ChatGPT. I gave it a link to Figma's S1 and asked it to make a presentation, which it did in less than five minutes. Olivia actually went on to say why she thought it was better. The first was efficiency. It took Claude four and a half minutes, while it took GenSpark 17, ChatGPT 19, and Manus 28 to make a serviceable deck. As Olivia points out, speed equals more iteration. When it came to precision, she said, it got the data correct, generated some of its own insights, and even framed an investment thesis. Formatting needed just a few tweaks. The only product that outperformed here was GenSpark, which took much longer. She found that it was editable. I asked it to make the slides more aesthetic, and it generated a new version in under two minutes with a more appealing design. Same with asking it to make the slides more financially rigorous. Very few other products can check their work in this way. In my estimation, this type of document output is going to become so commonly used with LLMs that we will be hard-pressed to remember a time when they didn't have these features natively. The idea of copy-pasting markup files into another program is just going to seem so absolutely archaic. I think that these will really and truly unlock whole new levels of productivity, even from where we are today. Now, on the theme of using different models for different purposes, a lot of discussion earlier in this week has been about which coding models are best and how people's behaviors are changing in that area. Specifically, we talked about how much behavior shift we've seen moving from Claude Code to Codex and shared that Sam Altman said that Codex usage had been up something like 10x over the past few weeks. Engineer Sawyer Hood showed a chart of agent sessions on their platform, showing that the number of sessions with Codex was going up while the number of sessions with Claude Code was coming down in fairly dramatic ways. When asked why he thought that was, he said it is just really good for the price. And I think as we discuss this idea of different models being good for different purposes, it's important to note that as we move more into production, this is not just a question of raw performance, but a question of how much performance you get for what cost. In their July market update, Menlo Ventures noted that almost half of AI programmers had upgraded to Claude 4 Sonnet, which was at the time the latest release. They remarked, this creates an unexpected market dynamic. Even as individual models drop 10x in price, builders don't capture savings by using older models. They just move en masse to the best performing one. I think that that is going to be less and less the case as we get further and further over the frontier of capability, and as more of these use cases move into bigger production, that simply requires more raw token consumption. And speaking of moving to production and actually caring about cost, Google's VO3 made some big updates this week. Indeed, overall, one category of use cases that are coming along quite a bit this year is image and video generation, and Google at this point seems to be establishing a dominant position. The key thing that we talked about around the release of Nano Banana last month was the idea that the model's improvement in editing capabilities meant that image generation had reached a point where it could be reliably used in a lot of additional professional workflows. With this week's update to VO3, Google seems to be attempting something similar for video generation. Now, some creators only cared about the fact that the update adds support for 1080p resolution and even more importantly, vertical videos, which matters greatly when it comes to generating short form content for social media. But Google are also showcasing VO3 Fast, which is a faster and more affordable version of the model. 
Google AI Studio head Logan Kilpatrick pointed to price drops with VO3 seeing a 46% decrease and VO3 Fast seeing a 62% decrease as part of the big innovation. He couldn't have put the goal of this release more clearly when he wrote, VO3 is stable now and ready for scaled production use. Now, in terms of where those numbers are, VO3, the original recipe, now costs around 40 cents per second of generation, which is down from 75 cents, and VO3 Fast is 15 cents per second, which is down from 40 cents. In a sample video posted by Google, a generated rock climber said, VO3 is now like 50% cheaper and higher quality, so go build. Now, VO3 was already a huge breakthrough in that it introduced audio generation baked directly into a video model. And while it has already seen a ton of use in spreading viral videos, and really I think represented a huge inflection point in the general usage of AI video, there was still a sense that many of those generations were largely about showing off what the model could do. Or alternatively, having some very, very basic, repeated types of uses, like the Bigfoot vlogs that were all over TikTok and Instagram Reels. With this update, Google is absolutely and very clearly targeting a user base that is going to put this to work for more professional uses. Sego Edgewee showed off what he'd done with VO3 for his fitness coaching platform, commenting, Really amazed with the result that I got on the first try. And while right now VO3 has established something of a lead, I would anticipate that over the next three to six months, you are going to see an absolute flood of highly competent video models with included audio generation that are trying as much as they can to also compete on price. As that happens, I guarantee that we will discover that there are some things that VO3 is best at, or VO4, or whatever we get next, but that there are other types of videos that other models are simply just still better suited for. And that, if anything, is the takeaway of this episode. It's fun to look at the changing relationships between Microsoft and Anthropic and OpenAI in dramatic Shakespearean terms, but ultimately, one of the key secrets to AI right now is that different models are good for different things. Anyways, friends, that's going to do it for today's AI Daily Brief. Appreciate you listening or watching, as always, and until next time, Peace.